Hey everyone, I'm David Seifer and I'm here today to talk about the Lamat revolver, Lamat's grape shot revolver. And um, I'm going to sort of place the gun in its historical context, talk about some of its uh, few more famous users, talk about where the gun is today. Um, it's been called everything from the most romantic sidearm of the Civil War to the most destructive handgun of its time. So let's take a look at this gun itself. This is actually a model reproduction made by Denix in Spain. The actual gun um, costing in its thousands to get a real one and about 1,000 from a reproduction from Pieta. So this is a non-working replica, um, but it gives a pretty good accurate representation of what the gun looks like and I'm going to go over some of its quick working parts. I'm not going to spend a long time with this as there's many other YouTube videos you can check out to get a better sense of the gun, but I wanted to give a quick um, quick overview. So right here, what's so special about the Lamat is that it would provide its user with both a nine shot rotating barrel as we can see here and an under barrel shotgun barrel or it was called in its time grape shot. Um, as you can see here, it would have a special picketing head that as we move it would advance the barrel forward you could fire and then this picketing head right here you on the actual gun would be able to flip down and hit this percussion cap which would be here and it would fire the 62 caliber shotgun barrel the actual barrels itself would be about 40 to 42 caliber and you would put the um lead balls in and gunpowder before that and then you would use this rod to sort of hammer it down as you see here to advance the barrel like so um for close quarters combat in his time this revolver was unparalleled i mean most times in the civil war you would have your average six shot revolver the 1851 navy the colt army but after your six shots in the heat of battle, you couldn't just reload. But here, with Lamat, you would have your six, your nine shots, and then your shotgun barrel. And then you wouldn't have to do what was called at the time the New York Reload, which was actually just using another revolver. So, um, let's talk about this gun's history. Let's first get into its name the grape shot revolver. Let's first just talk about grape shot. You know, I titled this YouTube video, A Whiff of Grape. Now that comes from 13 Vendemiere when Napoleon, working as the beginning before he even is emperor, is working with the royalist forces of France and sees some revolutionary forces coming toward him in Paris. And he says, give them a whiff of grape. Um, this being grape shot, these small cannonballs that were about the size of, well, a grape, and so the title Whiff of Grape comes about. Grape shot continues to be used in the Crimean War. You know, Lord Raglan talks about at the Siege of Sebastopol, the most horrendous fire of grape ever witnessed, and then to the Mexican-American War, with the famous as every child knew of the day, a little more grape, Captain Bragg, you know, telling them to give the Mexicans a little more oomph in the cannon. What he actually said was, or was actually said was, give him hell, Captain Bragg. But the thing's that, so calling something a grape shot, or what we now know as a shotgun with the small pellets, was very intimidating to have a grape shot revolver. So in its first tests in 1859 in New Orleans, it was said, this revolver, came and they said, a great improvement on Colt's revolver. Um, it was revolutionary. I mean, People would just say, this is something so exotic, so formidable, it'll change firearms. So, who invented this gun, the Lamat? Jean Alexandre Lamat, born in Bordeaux, France. The Colonel, or Doctor, Colonel, Doctor, Doctor Lamat, well, he had more claims to being a doctor than he did a Colonel, having actually done some work with yellow fever patients in New Orleans. A Colonel, he was kind of a so and so Colonel in the New Orleans Guard, but never fought a battle in his life. Um, he came up in 1856, this idea for a revolver where the cylinder would all revolve around a centrally placed shotgun barrel, as we can see here. Um, and so, the Max Grape shotgun was born. 
It was made by a man so proud of his unique invention that on every single gun he would have Lamatt's patent stamped on it. Now, as if we all know our history, two years after 1859 is 1861, and well, the coming of the Civil War. The Civil War begins. Lamatt finds himself in New Orleans, and as we all know, New Orleans, the largest city in the Confederacy until its capture in 1862 by Ben Butler's forces, sides with, well, the South. So, jean Alexandre Lamatt, this Frenchman, he decides to make all his contracts with the Confederacy, which we will later see in this presentation probably wasn't the best idea as well. The Confederacy lost, and having tied up all his um, funds and uh, connections with the Confederacy didn't turn out so well. Also, he um, was good friends with PGT Bargard, who we'll get to in a tiny bit. Um, so he secured um, plans to manufacture this gun for the Confederacy. It would be produced in Britain and France and shipped over. Um, now what's so interesting about the Lamatt's history is actually that it's entwined inherently with that of the Confederacy. Both the Revolver and the Confederate States of America were experiments that struggled with establishing itself with consistency and performance, with funding, international acceptance, and ultimately both the Confederacy and Lamatt never survived. Um, both entities finally succumbing to a competitor, whether that be better made English revolvers or the Union, with better manufacturing capabilities and more capital. So, let's talk about the Civil War now. So it's 1861, but there's no capabilities of gun manufacturing of this caliber of revolver in the South at the time. The North, as I just said, it's all these larger, um, factories and such, so it has to be made in Britain and France. But how would this gun get to the Confederacy? All around the Confederate States was surrounding a great naval blockade, Winfield Scott's Anaconda plan. Scott's Anaconda, Scott's Great Snake, all down the eastern seaboard from the Chesapeake Bay to the shores of the Gulf, Counterclockwise from the Keys to Matamoros, a deep water naval blockade would wall the Confederacy off from Europe, whatever aid might come from that direction. But many fast Confederate ships, these blockade runners, would be able to go to and fast, coming out of these inlets, bringing the gun and its supplies um, back and forth from Europe to the Confederate States. By the dark of the moon, it would be a slow ship and a clumsy driver to not make it in and out of these many entrances and outlets. So, now that we know how the gun got in and out of these ports, let's talk about some of its more famous users. Now, the gun being 25 Confederate States dollars versus the contemporary for what um, the contemporary Kerr revolver, another British gun, would be, which would only be about $5, it was quite inaccessible to the average Confederate private. So most of these generals ended up owning it, officers and well, yeah, generals. One of its most famous humor would be Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard, PGT Beauregard, also a Creole um, Frenchman like Lamatt. He would also be from New Orleans. P.G.T. Beauregard, as his biography calls him, Napoleon in, in gray. The first paladin of the Confederacy, the Confederacy's first real hero after Fort Sumter, the hero of Sumter, would own this gun. And then we would have Henry Wurz, Commandant of the bloody Andersonville prison camp, which would see about um, 29% casualties of all Union soldiers there. After the war, most Confederates were pardoned, but actually in an attempt to show that there were claws under the velvet federal glove. Henry Wurz would be the only major Confederate officer to be executed during the war after he would be tried and duly hung after trumped up charges on his deliberate cruelty to prisoners. Also owner of Lamatt found in his um, belongings after his execution. Then we have Braxton Bragg, his recent biography, biography calls him the most hated man in the Confederacy. Um, really horrible general, strict martinet, and all around the Confederacy's chief whipping boy for most of his failures in the, um, the Western theater, also owner of Lamatt. Stonewall Jackson, 
probably one of the most famous generals. Also, an earthly that. Cromwell leaned zealot, religious fervor, sometimes called the old blue light, his eyes would light up in battle. Um, we don't have exactly which model in that number was his, is not known, but in the Confederate paper we have the record of his being gifted one. And one of the most interesting stories with the Lamat and owners is Jeb Stewart, James Ewell Brown Stewart, head of the Confederate cavalry. Quite the figure, the dashing man of southern chivalry, of southern maiden dreams, the very bow sever, red lined cape, yellow sash, hat cocked to the side with an ostrich plume, red flower in his lapel, often sporting cologne. Stewart would actually be using the Lamatt revolver during his death at the Battle of Yellow Cavern. To get quite closer to the Union horseman going by, he comes right up to the fence. He's yelling, Come on, men, steady, steady, men, and give it to them. Instead, it was they who gave it to him. Anyways, one of them gave it to him. A dismounted private, John A. Huff, who promptly shot him in the stomach. John A. Huff, a member of the 5th Michigan Cavalry, um, was a former sharpshooter um, who would won a prize for, for best marksmanship in his regiment. Um, Stuart would die a few days later, and his lament is actually now at the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, along with his ostrich plumed hat. So, as tied in with the fall of the Confederacy in 1865 came the fall of the Lamatt. When the last port was closed in 1865, Fort Fisher, there was no more way of getting the gun in and out of the Confederacy. Um, and so the story sort of came to an end. Um, it was now impossible to get any guns in the South where Lamatt had staked all his sales. There were other attempts after the war to get it sold in Egypt and abroad, but it didn't help that this pistol was really a whopping five pounds fully loaded. I mean, quite a heavy gun here. Um, nor its large price range, and also that Sometimes it's actually quite shoddily produced. None of the various types of hinge nose hammers and sturdy in any of the models. The loading levels are not as good of a design as the best American revolvers of the period. And also it's odd caliber. The 40 to 42 caliber bullet does not allow for the average American bullet of 44 caliber, which was used in time to be put in. It's just too large of a caliber. Um, so the map kind of faded into obscurity. Um, in 1866, pressure from creditors and former business partners brought the closure and liquidation of the factory, and the Lamatt now is sort of faded into history. It's mostly written about in these books on curio firearms, or um, guns of the Civil War, or guns of the South, the Confederate Lamatt revolvers. We see here a recent book by Doug Adams. Um, after the war, both a pin fire and a center fire would be developed, along with a carbine version with stock and a baby Lamat, which was actually quite smaller. But none of these really would change the eventual outcome. So, in a new era with increased mass production and interchangeable parts, this gun was now sort of, as it was custom made by these different factories, impractical and obsolete. And so it would end a unique chapter in firearms history. Now, the gun is mostly seen in some new um, television shows. Most famously right now is HBO's Westworld. It's the main gun of the villain, the man in black. Also, a few years back would be seen in the Marvel movie Jonah Hex, um, used by the villain there. Maybe it's the fact that it was such a confederate gun is that it's now seen as the villain. But besides that, um, the Lamatt really is not seen very often these days, it's sort of just this curio thing, a revolver shotgun. Um, but that's so much more than the story belies. Um, and that is a small little clip on the Lamatt.